Hello everyone. Thank you for coming. Hello guys. We're really excited to be here uh, presenting for the first time at FMX on yep. behalf of VPP Advertising. Thank you SideFX for inviting us. My name is Mario Dubek. I'm one of the senior VFX supervisors at UPP Advertising. My colleague Ricardo is one of our technical directors. And uh, we would like to share with you a couple of uh, project-related challenges uh, our team encountered while utilizing Houdini in virtual production and also the solutions that we found out for those. I will be presenting uh, more from the point of view of a VFX supervisor who is relying on Houdini capabilities and the Houdini members on our team. And Ricardo will be sharing more knowledge and know-how on the behind the scenes, how those guys in our team set it all up. But before we get to that, um, some of you might not be familiar with our studio and our work. So uh, UPP Advertising, is one of the three main departments of Universal Production Partners in Prague. We have a long history in VFX, it's more than 20 years we have been doing it in, at our studio. And we were lucky enough to grow even the, during the COVID times. Uh, basically started doing larger and more compelling projects than ever before. And our studio also acquired uh, film studios near Prague and we do have a LED wall set up as well. So we are getting closer to the virtual production stage. And in advertising department, we mostly post-produce commercials, but recently we stepped also into the music video world by finishing the latest piece for Megan Thee Stallion and Dua Lipa with the amazing director Dave Mayers. So let us play for you a small showcase of what we do at our studio. Thank you for watching. As you know, the subject of our presentation is Houdini and virtual production. Uh, we started developing uh, virtual production when the COVID hit the world. So it was not necessarily for the on stage uh, LED walls, 
but as a tool set that should allow us to kickstart the creative process of the of the whole commercial development and uh, to bring the whole creative team closer together to cooperate. Um, so we'll play a small video that sh shows what our tool set currently offers mostly the producers and uh, the directors and then later we will start diving into the case studies that are related to Houdini. Everybody is talking about virtual production these days, and that's for a good reason. Short or insufficient time has always been the enemy in the advertising world and virtual production can help you in several ways. Virtual production is a digital film set where director, DOP, and other creatives can meet not just for a few days but many weeks before the actual shoot. We take them virtually onto the existing location, add all the necessary props and lift control digital actors, and set the light conditions the way it will be on the day of the shoot. Yeah, that's good. Maintain that position, so hold this position. All right, now he's looking at the shark on his left shoulder, and when I call action, he turns and he looks over his right shoulder. And action. Your team or clients can also join the session in one click. So once you reach your existing location, everybody is on the same page. You can rehearse the shots, cut them together, and then share them with agency creatives or clients. You can pick up a time of day, an accurate sun position, experiment with the film lenses, try different angles. The whole process is guided by our minimalistic team which consists of assistant director, camera operator, digital actors, and technical staff. And then what Miro could do is he's looking up now. He, if he could just put his arm above, his head, hand above, the other hand, uh, his right hand. The overall flexibility of this approach could save time and cost when it comes to decision making. Within a couple of hours, you can make many minutes of shots, use a handheld camera, rush an arm, cranes, drones to achieve realistic shots. Feel free to drop us a line and see you in a new digital world. So, we hope these couple of examples that will follow um, based on the case studies can be of an inspiration to you how to address the initial creative challenges or technical challenges and how to connect the Houdini and Unreal Engine virtual world. Uh, the first project we would like to mention um, is uh, the Nissan project. This project was very early in the COVID times and there, there were a few challenges that it brought to us. First, there was an understandable creative idea, but not a clear visual reference of, of what the CG shots should look like. Second, during the new travel uh, restrictions, no one from the creative team could fly to Prague to develop uh, the CG sequence with us. And uh, as is nowadays usual, there was not enough prep time or post-production schedule, and we needed to really concentrate everything into a short time. Uh, plus, that was quite specific for this project, the opening sequence was intercut with real shots and then smoothly uh, ended up in all the real uh, footage that was shot later on the day. So the way we were framing the shots, uh, the style of editing, the pace had impact on how the client will then later shoot the real part of the commercial. And to address all these challenges, we realized that we have to switch to the virtual shoot session and basically bring everyone creatively involved on the same page at the same time and discuss and generate the CG shots already during the session. So first, our Houdini team had a standard WIP process of developing the assets that were later fed into Unreal Engine. This was mostly the cage of the car that was supposed to be materializing and also the holographic treatment of some uh, featured mechanical parts that were important for the client to see. And as you can imagine, there was a lot of creative discussion and back and forth generating the still images of how dense the cage should be, what speed should it move, which lines should materialize, what is important to f you know, guide the camera and flow the story into the real part of the of the film and Ricky will describe more technically how we achieved the cage in, in Houdini. Yep. So hi everybody. Um, I will dive more into how we create the car and uh, so first of, 
first thing first, we uh, clean. We have the model of the car, and we clean up the part that we didn't need. And so select the edges and use then the primitive salt uh, to basically get rid of uh, the geometry and get just the edges. Then we use the dissolved node to like keep just the edges that we needed, and so that is the outline of the car. Now, uh, we could have done it uh, with the labs tool now. Uh, basically, it's called edge curve to uh, edge, edge group to curve. And uh, this simplify this three node in just one node, and it gives you like a clean geo. So uh, that's a new thing if you want to try it. Uh, then we repeat the process also for uh, the wheels. And so we select the edges, get the thing that we needed, and then how we created the outlines of the, of the wheels. But then, as you can imagine, it wasn't enough. So we needed more curve. And for this thing, we use uh, the um, Boolean node. And with the Boolean node, uh, with the same option, like you can see, it's like on the left, we have the model of the card. On the right, we have a lot of planes. And we extract the curves from those planes when the intersection occurs between the planes and the car. So that gives us uh, like outlines of the car from before, plus this. And then we repeat the process a couple of times until we got uh, the, um, like a couple of variation. But then, if you see it, like uh, if you are a Udini user, uh, you see that there is a problem there. And each segment of those curves is like one primitive, and that cannot work for animation. So we use the polypath tool to like, now it's clean. And then we can go to animation. To animation for animation, we started with uh, experimenting with the uh, simple curve tool. But we soon realized that uh, this wasn't enough. Like, it didn't give us enough control. So we wrote our own curve tool, let's call it like that. And we used the Groom library. If you get the chance to experiment with it, it's a great tool to addition to your like, basic tool. And we had the, now we had control over how fast the lines are going are gonna to go how random each line is, is going to be. So that's how we basically created the outlines and the animation for it. For the export to a real engine, because it's just curves, and then we use a sweep node or a polypath node, um, it's like very simple geo. So Alembic w was working for us. And like if you needed a, via a variation, if they ask a variation during the shoot, it was like, done, so we didn't bother with the, uh, exporting like VATs or uh, find other kind of export. Alembic was working fine for us. And that's how we make the car. Yeah, we were even considering, I think, the HDAs and yep. just uh, you know, promoting a couple of attributes to have control in the Unreal session to change maybe the flow. Because you know, when, when you start framing for the actual shots with the client, something that you visualized and tested uh, yourself, might not work because there might be um, lines already materialized that are in the way of the camera. But um, the HDA, the problem with that was that it had to be rebaked every frame, and that basically bro broke the whole virtual shoot, you know, real time approach that we needed, like really playback wise, to record the takes. So we ended up having um, on the side a standby Houdini artist that could make these changes very quickly. Yep. but in Houdini, and then feed them back as LMB caches that were either updated or as a new version. Um, if the changes were taking a little bit longer, because the, the request from the director on that moment when we were shooting was more complex, uh, we ended up switching to another shot uh, in the storyboard that, uh, you know, uh, the, the current LMB cache was working for that kind of shot, so we started shooting that one. The artist was on the side updating the caches. Yep. And when he was ready and we were ready with another take, we switched back to the, to the previous shot. Some changes uh, didn't require this uh, real-time change for the shoot. We just recorded the take as it was 
and they were basically adjusted later in the finalization post-process of that. And uh, this is a small showcase of how the shots looked when we were capturing them in Unreal Engine. So you can consider that as a trade-off, you know, not having the HDA, although it would be capable of many changes when, when the attributes are promoted. Yep. Uh, there's just the real-time necessity on the shoot. Um, you know, it was, it, it was much easier to have a standby offline editor for, for all the caches. So the next project we'd like to mention, it's called Ad Council. Here, our virtual production was mainly focused on testing the, the concept, the creative idea of the film, uh, because you know, shooting is extremely expensive, so we first need to, to see if the whole idea works and uh, if the commercial can be framed in the right way for, for the idea to be sold properly. And um, another thing is that when you are shooting on set with something like a huge aquarium that needs to break, uh, the uh, shark needs to fly out of it and everything needs to come to almost a frozen moment without having a good previous, you are not sure if you are framing for the right duration if the action of the actors is correct. And although this could have been a, a standard previous approach, because everything was um, so crucial for the, the creatives and for the director, it was much easier to give them in the hand the possibility to remote control during a Zoom session, our virtual camera operator and our team, and basically shoot the commercial like a rehearsal in, in Unreal, and then reshoot it later, you know, of course, much better way, uh, for real. Um, the simulation was uh, again like with the Nissan. In the Nissan we were uh, generating the cages here. Our artists were generating iterations of the simulation, changing you know how much uh, water gets through, when is the right moment to freeze, and rendering multiple um, angles and lighting scenarios. When we were in a good spot, uh, for the client, this asset uh, that was developed in Houdini needed to be transferred uh, into Unreal Engine. And uh, our initial idea was, of course, uh, RBD, bone, you know, RBD simulation of the shards to be as a bone-based um, uh, FBX animation export. And for the liquid, uh, let's go with the Alembic. But in the early tests, we realized that the speed is just uh, too slow. Uh, the Alembic caches were huge, and the time ramping uh, was uh, very complicated with the Alembic. So we decided to switch to uh, vertex animated textures yep. for uh, just the water. Um, but when you have a bone-based animation in the sequencer and you have uh, VAT-based uh, meshes, it's not a, there is no simple way with one attribute in Unreal Engine to control the time, uh, time editing or the freezing moment, uh, slipping of the sequence. So we ended up switching also the shards to uh, vertex animated textures because then it's one system and you can control it with uh, one attribute. There was just one glitch we yep. encountered, um, which usually wouldn't be an issue. And that's that the simulation in Houdini, in the first frame, didn't align with the first frame of the vertex animated texture in Unreal Engine. And usually you're uh, simulating pre-rolls and you never see the first frame uh, on the actual virtual shoot. But here the first frame was very important because it was the aquarium that was clean and not broken. And there were many shots that were framed for this anticipation and graduation of the story. So, uh, it, I think the exporter back then was 2.1, yep, and that, exactly. there was an issue with contacted side effects, and they were kind enough to dive deep into what's the issue. They figured out as a fix, yep. and they were kind enough also to provide us with the pre-release of um, ex VET exporter 3.0 yep. that solved the issue. And so just mentioning that thank you side effects and never hesitate to contact them when you are encountering an issue because they usually try and find a solution. Okay, so let's talk about these VITs. Um, so um, we had a problem uh, with this project even in VITs. 
Uh, I will explain it later, but let's focus on how a VAT is built and what it does. So if you go to the out context in Udini, you have this VAT exporter and um, you select what type of VAT, VAT export do you want and then the tool will export an FBX geometry plus two textures. Uh, one is, user, is position, the other one is rotation. So what these two textures are is like if you check it on the X axis, you find the point position and of your geometry and on the Y you find the frame. So what it means that it means that the engine knows every frame the position of each point. So it's basically an animation. Uh, problem is uh, for this project we have a lot of frames and uh, we run out of space and the 8K uh, text VAT wasn't enough, so we split it into two VATs that were switched during the virtual shoot. Uh, so if you encounter this kind of problem, you can just easily attach two VATs together in a way and it solves our problem and then you see our result is like it's not perfect, but it gives uh, it gives us during the virtual shoot like uh, how it's supposed to look like. Yeah, the, the, especially the frozen moment. Yep. That that was the thing that required that extra framing. And while we are in the world of VATs, this is a very simple, um, simple <laughs> example. Yep. It's just to show that how you can combine Houdini crowds and, and VAT approach to generate full stage of um, crowds into Unreal Engine as a background support for for a shot. So in this one, we had a project that required like a full stadium crowd and they wanted to see it in a real so problem <laughs> um, so VATs again uh, but this time was a like very tight schedule so what we end up doing like is downloading a bunch of characters applying some random animation to them and then use uh, bring it into the engine and then use a tool called uh, model and actors from the marketplace that you can instance uh, basically um, assets and then create like the rows for the stadium so it's not i will i will say that is not the best approach uh, if you check now uh, the pro project Titan that side effects released uh, a couple of months ago. You can see like how a crowd should be set up. And the thing is, uh, in that setup, you have a lot of more variation, either even um, either in animation and also in um, uh, variation of each pieces of the crowd. And we would like to do a next. The, as a next version, we would like to integrate those those tools that we've seen that in Project Titan with our uh, tool that give us like okay, we need like ten people. Okay, let's say ten, and we have ten variation of the people, but with those variation. So another interesting uh, work we were recently tackling, which I mentioned also in the intro, was the CG heavy music video Sweet as Pie, and there was especially this. Um, moving forest scene or sequence um, that you know when you're uh, seeing the result you can imagine that it had to be developed uh, with very many uh, iterations flexibility almost real time seeing it in a sequence how, how the flow of the layout works and obviously this the only tool that we could set it up in was the unreal engine for all the virtual editing this wasn't part of the virtual shoot but because we had experience of the real-time capabilities before, uh, we realized that this is, uh, the Unreal Engine is the best solution how to develop the layouts, uh, approve it with the director, but finishing was supposed to happen in Houdini. And that's where we ended up using the standard FBX yep. approach, back and forth. The, the challenge was to keep everything uh, in line. So you, you, we needed to make sure that whatever changes in Unreal Engine, it reflects in the Houdini uh, scenes. Even the, even the lighting, uh, the positions, the, the selection of the three assets, uh, pretty much everything. 
So we had to build a robust uh, system of scripts um, and expressions that were cleaning up um, all the imports exports from the Unreal Engine. And uh, there was uh, one tricky part which we realized uh, very early on, and that was the export itself from Unreal Engine. If you use the standard FBX file exporter in the project level, um, it, for some reason, it pretty much breaks all the parenting, all the hierarchy, and um, the native Unreal Engine actors, which are basically locators or nulls, they lose their custom names. And when you bring that FBX to Houdini, you end up with just you know millions of um, primitives or uh, items. Mm. Uh, all the custom names are lost, so we don't know how to, even if you would have some scripts, there is nothing to grab onto. Uh, in Houdini. So what we used instead, uh, we found out it works, is when you select all the elements in your Unreal Engine scene, you bring them into sequencer, you keyframe at least one frame, it can be any frame, we generally use the frame zero, and then the sequencer knows what to export, and this, the FBX exporter in the sequencer, when it's keyframed, is written differently and it retains all the hierarchy, all the parenting, all the nodes, keep their custom names, whatever uh, we decided to give them. And that we could read easily in Houdini and then the team had <laughs> hands full of scripting. Yep, yep, yep. Um, so uh, let's start uh, talk talking about the import, actually, because um, if you import an FBX and you leave everything on your heap file, as you know, it becomes like gigantic and we didn't want that, especially with all the version of the animation that we will get like later on. So what we did is like in the import FBX node, we disabled the import of joint skin because we didn't need that. And if you scroll down, uh, in the end you find um, you need to uncheck uh, like file geometry, file, file geometry SOP, import file geometry SOP. So your FBX is not actually stashed into the heap file. And that was the first step. The second step, once we got the network in, was if you dive into the network, we find that uh, each tree, each parent node of the tree itself has all the transform that we've seen in um, a real engine. So um, what we did at that point is create a point inside that, uh, inside that parent node and assign a string that it was the tree type. Then uh, with two object merge, we just import that point with that attribute in one object merge and the other one was just uh, we enabled the geometry packed option. So in the packed transform, we had all those transform again. And then we use like uh, the, this one, we use exactly this one to get a more easy, uh, let's say, manipul uh, manipulation attribute than just a matrix. So we get orientation and scale back again uh, so we can tweak it uh, later on. And for the actual instancing of the trees, we decided to skip the copy to point the attribute for pieces workflow in this case, uh, because with uh, the instance path attribute workflow was easier to manage like uh, time shifting, changing the tree type on the fly by just editing the string. So uh, we did this type of workflow just to accelerate the process. And so this was mainly based for uh, or built for the tree layout because that was driving the, the scenery. The, um, the landscape itself was not so important, it just needed to look good. So for that we developed a procedural tool. Yeah, so the procedural tool that we were mentioning is like, so imagine that every time that someone changes the, um, the layout, the, the actual terrain had to rebuild itself, but uh, doing manually wasn't an option, like the changes were too quick, even like maybe 
you get one chain the, the hour after, okay, let's get rid of the manual painted and deformed uh, terrain. So we started to build like um, a procedural way to doing that. And the first part was just, okay, let's get, get rid of the terrain that we don't need, like with the, that wasn't in camera. So like the clip, clip, uh, clip node was just helping to do that. And then we sterilized the, um, so the thing is, now we got rid of the, of the, uh, of the part that we don't see, but we don't have enough detail. So we had to remesh it. But we had to remesh it like based on the distance from the camera. And at that time, we didn't know that the remesh uh, supports like remesh based on attributes. So we did it in, an in another way. And we did it by first uh, spherilized our, our grid. And by deforming that and applies the remesh on the, um, on the spherical version, uh, we just get that um, remesh based on camera that we need. And then we use the rest soap to rebuild the grid that we had initially. At this point, uh, for actually the deformation, uh, we just created this thing. So what this uh, VEX node does is like um, taking each point of the trees, each three points, and then each, um, each point on the ground is basically checking 16 of them and then checking where, where they are and based on weight, is adjusting his side. So we exactly know where the trees are and we are adjusting the weight for it. And so we have this first deformation of the terrain, but this, as you can see, is not very good. It's not very appealing. So we started to layer on top like a, let's call it like a plateau look to it. Uh, and as you can see here, you have this flat plane and we create that flat Part by just checking the near point position and then adjusting with the LERP function. Uh, at this point, we had the basic look, but as you can see, if you check like um, a real um, a real reference, you see that there are slopes uh, when you have like this difference. So we started to create those by first identifying those by calculating the dot product between the normal and the up vector. And so we mask those out. Then we create like a um, mask, let's call it mask, that goes, uh, that is more like a gradient, that it was going from the center of the slope to the edge, and then we apply a noise on top of it uh, to the position of those points but with the epsilon component zero out, so it will just spread, but not go up. And that's how we created the procedural uh, landscape that was used later on for like instances, graph, uh, gra uh, grass and like flowers, the usual stuff to like enrich the, um, the overall look. And um, so, as you can see, from the video above, like uh, it's like just placing, adapting, placing, and adapting. Okay, and we would like to finish the presentation with the last project. Uh, it's our ongoing R&D uh, project that helps us debug uh, the virtual production or the workflow. And it also allows us to extend the feature list of what we can offer for, to the client, what they can see, what they can shoot digitally or project uh, on um, the trans lights or even use as a LED light background. And um, all these virtual uh, shoot sessions can either be as a previous or as a basis for a full CG commercial. You have seen in previous case studies that you know, Alembic, FBX, uh, VATs, all these uh, tools, they work pretty well. And in a standard situation, you don't really need much more. But when you want to feature a full landscape, uh, those are not enough. Uh, and if you use them, they either become too heavy and you can't shoot real time, or they don't allow you to transfer enough detail. So 
when we first when we first mentioned the landscapes, um, our goal was to see in the live virtual shoot session either a believable representation of a real location that the client picked or a believable representation of the high-res made-up landscape that is later post-produced in Houdini. Um, and to achieve this, we couldn't use the built-in Unreal Engine uh, landscaping tool, although it's very powerful. There is no one-to-one -one connection to Houdini. But thanks to uh, the cap compatibility of uh, height fields in Unreal Engine and Houdini, we were able to go the opposite direction. So we first developed the high quality uh, landscapes in Houdini through many iterations, like uh, all the cases before. And when these landscapes were beautiful and uh, ready enough and approved by the client, we just, for the cleanliness of it, we imported the high res landscapes into a new Houdini scene, uh, projected them on a lower resolution. Uh, hate fields, and those hate fields were then transferred uh, with all the maps, textures, and custom attributes to Unreal Engine to regenerate the same but for real time environment. So, um, quickly, quickly, let's go through how we create the terrain. So, uh, what we did here, we started with a low res high field, projected real um, high field. Uh, High, yeah, high data scans from like real world, and so we get a real a real base to go to build upon. So then we apply some noises to it, distortion like the usual workflow for terrains, uh, erosions. Uh, um, apply some mask until we got the terrain that we wanted. As you can see, the progression, and uh, at the end we got the final look, let's call it that way. And uh, at this point, it was like, okay, how we get it to a real engine without losing this uh, thing that we build so far? So what we did, uh, we actually use Udini Engine. And if you feed Udini Engine with the uh, high field, uh, when uh, Aria reads them, uh, it will just create the standard landscape, and then you can use it as like a previous option. And um, I would say that this uh, was, in this project especially, saved us a couple of times because we didn't know uh, how, how, how we could have done it without it. So that's, that was a lifesaver, find, find out that Houdini engine support li like high fields. And that's what we've done. For the texturing part, we just bake an 8K texture out of, um, color texture out of Houdini, and we transfer it to Houdini, uh, to Unreal. And then we use this setup uh, to like project it from the top to the high field. Because the problem with landscaping, um, uh, Unreal Engine, it doesn't come with UV maps, so we just created our own UV maps and then apply the texture on top of it. Yeah, and, uh, and basically for just the visual appeal, you know, yeah. for the far landscapes, the 8K textures are just fine. Yeah, the, you wouldn't recognize the, the low resolution, but when you get closer to the road, when you're framing for the car, uh, we just needed to blend it also with the procedural yep. uh, textures in, in Unreal Engine. So it was a combo of exported color maps and Unreal Engine. Um, and when you have the landscapes, you also need the flora. Uh, we split the flora for two, uh, into two approaches. Uh, one was uh, more heavy and fully controllable, and that was for the hero flora. Uh, we called it hero, hero flora just because it changes completely the look of the landscape. And it even influences how you frame for the shots. You know, when you have tall trees or bushes somewhere and the car is passing by and suddenly you realize that it's covered by the bushes or it gets into the shadow. And um, we needed full control over it back and forth because when you capture those takes in, in the virtual shoot session and then you want to generate the high quality result in Houdini, you need to make sure that the same tree as said with the same size, uh, same orientation is on, on the same spot. 
And this also will allow us to uh, generate, when, when you, for example, use speed tree, yep. you generate uh, the Unreal Engine version of the same tree, you generate the high res, and you make sure that you see both in the same spot. And to achieve it, we used um, the point scatter HDA with all the uh, ID instancing attributes and um, s selection placement scaling, basically all the attributes that you need to transfer, they were, they were retained. Okay, so uh, what we actually done it is like um, taking the geometry with uh, the attributes from those maps that I was mentioning before and remap the density, scatter a bunch of points on it uh, for the broad scattering. And then we just select like a few, a few patches, uh, scatter also some points on them. So we had like broad scattering, then we have like a few points where we want to merge them back together. And then we use the attribute from pieces workflow to like actually scatter um, asset on them. So attributes from pieces will take our asset, uh, copy those attributes on the points, then copy to points will grab the variance and then do the instancing part. But how we get it to Unreal? Uh, so Unreal um, Houdini engine supports um, an attribute called uh, Unreal Instance that uh, lets you basically exactly this one. If you check uh, here, uh, you can see that uh, you can target uh, a, an asset that is already in the engine and then the engine itself will take that asset and use a real native instancing on top. So what we end up doing is like, okay, let's not export every time all the geometry and uh, just export the points and Unreal will take care of it. And that's how we export the Eero Flora to uh, Udini and to uh, Unreal Engine. It literally becomes plug and play. It literally become plug and play. Yeah. So uh, the, like the Unreal guys don't have to do the manual no. setting up because the Unreal engine just recognizes uh, exactly. stuff, so saves time yep. a lot. Especially when you do need to do an update or an iteration, you can't lose time on the virtual shoot session for the Unreal engine guys to start plugging in uh, the instances. You, they just reload the HDA or refresh it, rebake, yep. and, and you have a new landscape flora. And the, the second that I mentioned is um, not for the hero flora, but just for the visual appeal. It's similar to the blending of the textures. Um, you want to make sure that when the clients join the session, they see the picture as beautiful as possible. Now, for the director, it might not be so important uh, to see this non-hero flora there, but it just you know makes for a better shoot when you see all the grass and, and small flowers. Making and the advantage here is that it doesn't have to match what you'd later do in Houdini. You can scatter in Houdini uh, differently the assets. You can adjust it later on when you are finishing the f uh, the shot. So that gives us the advantage of um, the procedural foliage generator in in Unreal uh, Unreal Engine. So we didn't have to be precise. We just need it to be very effective and efficient and keeping it in real time. And Ricky will mention yep. how we populated it with assets. Yeah. So what we, uh, what we did is like, uh, if you create like, uh, like masks inside, uh, let's stop it here so we can see it. So um, if you generate high field masks, and you use Houdini engine to read that cache. You, Houdini, um, once you are inside Unreal, the shader can read those masks. And from that, you can use the foliage system that is nati natively in uh, Unreal to populate the scene with like secondary, um, secondary assets like flowers, grass, the, the whole thing that you, Mario showed you before. Uh, and so that's how we created the secondary scatter system. And like we were mentioning, we didn't need something like one-to-one uh, -one match. We just needed something to fill up the environment and 
to generate this asset, we used like uh, noises, uh, masked by geometry, painted geometry. We use pretty much whatever we we could to generate those maps. And yeah, this is the 8K texture that I was mentioning before, and this is uh, the material with the foliage system plugged into it. And these are the masks, and this all the geometry that we scatter onto them. Uh, someone, say, someone of the uh, Unreal guys would say that's overkill to instant geometry. It was. So I think next time we'll do it with just atlases and we should be fine. Uh, for the uh, ingestion of the um, assets, uh, we just use like uh, on the production side, so offline rendering, uh, we use Alembics. We import the Alembics uh, with the file, uh, file name option enabled that in our case was called ABC file name. And then we uh, find a subfolder that it was containing the texture. And then we create an array that contains all those textures. And then by manipulating that array, we could extract, uh, I don't know, map color, uh, normal, opacity, all those maps. So at the end, we could have like one shader and those maps were like loading for each point. So uh, it was a time saver because like when you have like one, hundreds of assets, creating each individual material wasn't like an option. So we did it in this way and it was working for us. And you know, so we have the landscape, we have the flora, and now we need also the road to drive and the car to drive the road on. And um, again, the task was yep. to build a procedural tool with a lot of iteration possibilities, yep. real fast changes uh, to be able to bring it in and back. So a lot of pain for, for our team. But, and especially when the director and the supervisor, they keep changing on uh, the road and, and the brief, you can end up with like almost infinite loop of iterations because every time you change the road, you also want the landscape to adjust to it to make it feel like it belongs there. Otherwise, you will just end up with a, almost like a floating road. So you, end, you, know, you keep uh, iterating and one changes the other. So it's almost really infinite loop. Yeah, it's we infinite had to loop. stop at some point, but <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> when it was go looking good enough. So, so um, to build the road, we started from like drawing the curve and then we reprojected on the terrain that we created before. And uh, this one, uh, once we had the curve, we use a sweep node to get the geo out of it. And once we got the geo out of it, it was time to uh, change the terrain cordialing to the road. And to do that, we created two sets of the, of the terrain. One, it was, let me show you here. Okay. So, in this case, what we did is like taking the chunk of the terrain that was almost occluded by the road, Ray used the ray node to like get the point, the position of the point to the road level. And this was one. And the other one was just the same terrain, but with a mask, a gradient mask that was going from the core of the road to the edge of the road. And then we used like a simple mix node and we mixed the two position. And so we had like, a perfect, a perfect blending between the two terrains. And then we use, uh, we re-glue re, uh, re this section of the terrain to the main, uh, to the main um, terrain. And that's how we end up with a procedural system to change road and terrain at the same time. And it also gave us the, the basis for the main car driving yep. because it was curve based. Um, the only tricky part about the car driving on the road is, um, and we found out that we need to watch out for it, is the secondary animation of the car. Because, you know, cars, they lean differently based on how fast they drive, what, what curve they take. There can be some sliding, some wind force that is pushing the car. And for the wide shots, it doesn't really matter. But when you are in a virtual shoot session, you want the, the 
the OP and the director to frame even for the beauty shots in the close-ups, and you use only the base curve animation of the car that just you know, in a stupid way follows, follows the curve without any, any adjusting or any suspension behavior or anything like that. You record the take, you have a nice angle of the light, for example, or something that the clients want to sell, which is usually a logo, and then you go to Houdini site to finish uh, the shot. You start implementing these secondary animations because otherwise the car looks too rigid, and you realize you're framed for something completely different. And you don't want to end up in a situation when clients saw and edited something that they liked during the virtual shoot, and you're trying to reproduce it after changing the animation, but you never get really there, and it's a lot of pain, and it's again, back and forth readjusting. So one of our power users was uh, able to generate um, like a curve-dependent, purely VEX-based uh, rig for yep. all the secondary influencing of the car behavior and movement. It didn't have to be re-simulated, which was, again, the advantage for the virtual shoot, because every time we needed to do a change, we didn't do it in Unreal Engine, although we could through an HDA, but we are encountering the same issue of rebaking and losing the real-time speed. But at least when he does it, he can do it almost real-time and just feed it back to, to Unreal Engine. No simulation, no, just changing the path, changing the parameters, and you're good to go for another take of the of the shot. Yep. So I will try to explain how we did it. Um, so what this rig does, uh, so it takes the curve of the road, then um, resample the curve uh, based on the speed. So the points, when there is acceleration, the acceleration, the point will get closer together or dis more distance. You get more distance out of it. And so by doing that, we had, for each point, the position of the rear axis of the car. And from that, we generate other four points of the wheels, for the wheels. And uh, because the position of the wheels and the orientation of the wheels along the, the road will change, and each, each, uh, each wheel will have a different orientation, we create like four more curves that were representing the uh, the point, like the position of the wheels along the road. From those four points, we create like a plane, and from the center point, we uh, instance the actual geometry of the car. And then from that point on, we use like for acceleration, and acceleration is the system that I was mentioning before. Like when the point got closer, you get a break, and so that leaning forward. And then we have, and then when you have acceleration, you have like that leaning back. For the leaning side to side, um, I think our guy was actually insane, but more power to it. Uh, like he actually uh, calculate the centripetal and centrifugal force that we would apply on the car. And then we applied th that force on the actual suspension. And uh, that was what gi was giving us that side-to-side -side secondary animation. And um, at this point, we had um, rigging, a rigging um, uh, a rig car with those options that we could just change with a few parameters, and that was it. Um, yeah. And then just, uh, as I mentioned, it's yep. still offline. It's, yep. not, it's not in, uh, in Unreal Engine. And we're still figuring out next ways, uh, ideally how to live link it yep. from Houdini. There are some issues because whatever we set up for the car is so custom set up with all the axis changes yep. that we're doing that the live link by default doesn't uh, digest it well no. yet. <laughs> for, for standard setup, it does for, for our car not yet. So there is still a lot of R&D on that project that is happening. And um, Yeah, so uh, one more thing before uh, uh, going to this one. Um, like Mario was mentioning, uh, so our next step would be like transferring that rig to the um, 
a real, real live link setup. And to do that, we successfully transferred that rig to a KineFX rig. And then there is a plugin that you can find on GitHub uh, from SideFX that is called UE uh, KineFX Live Link. And with that, you can actually link the two sessions together. And uh, for us, uh, the two sessions worked, but at the moment of the connection, the orientation and scale was a bit off, so we couldn't use it on the real live shoot, but we are working on it. So that's what's, what, what's next on the rigging part. And um, on the other part that we are working on uh, is um, USD. So let's talk about it a little bit more on the UE side of things. Uh, so for transferring data back from the uh, Unreal that you're seeing here to Udini, we use the Omniverse suite. Uh, why the Omniverse suite? Because for, in four clicks, you can basically export the entire level or, or some, so, some asset in like a USD file. And then that file can be read back into Dini and with just a bit of cleanup uh, uh, with a prune node, you get rid of the collision geometry that comes with, the, with that export and you have like a one, almost one-to-one -one, uh, match. I say almost because in our case, the um, time dilation that we applied on the animation didn't work. But as, as, I'm, as I'm watching this, uh, I must say like, um, just get out of it, just all those data in one four click is, is awesome, especially if you starting to lay out things for the actual production scene. Yeah, and you can reproduce the time dilation yep. easily, but just matching the, the attributes yeah. of the curve in, in Houdini. Yeah. So. One more thing, like uh, we, for skeletal animation, you have to follow like a special setup, special. I, you have to be a little bit, it's a bit picky, so, uh, when you have skeletal animation, you have to take the sequencer from, from your continent browser to the actual level and then do the export. That way the animation gets through it and you have it in, then in, uh, uh, in Udini. Back. So that's what's going on with us. Uh, thank you. And that's the, yeah, that's the yeah. end of the case studies and the presentation. And you know you can imagine there is a big team behind everything that we have shown you. We just want to shout out a couple of special thanks to mm -hmm. uh, the core team members. And uh, of course, you know uh, if you are interested in working with us on more amazing projects, and we are always looking for new talented artists to join our team. So you can either drop us an email or come talk to us later today or tomorrow. Um, we'll be happy to yep. talk to you. And if there are any questions for us so i think now is the time if we have any time left <laughs> just we'll okay. just wait for the Fortunately, we don't have any time left. well okay. that that makes it simple <laughs> 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 thank you